Oh, the gothic industrial underground club scene was a massive influence on the books. In fact, it was so influential, the title of the first book, The Gothic Rainbow, is an eponymous reference to a goth industrial nightclub in the story. Even the climax of the sequel, Anun's Maelstrom Festival, takes place at a festival concert inspired by the first Lollapalooza in 1991. Now, in my personal life, I got into that music in 1987, but I didn't really start clubbing and going to shows until about 1989. So for me, the 80s and 90s eras blended together in a single time. I don't really differentiate the decades. And thankfully, I was living in Cleveland at that time, and as anyone familiar with the history of that music can tell you, a majority of the most influential American bands in the scene were born in those Rust Belt towns between Chicago and New York. And many quirks of the characters and events in the story were based upon actual experiences I had during those years. So, yes, the Vampire Noctuaries duology is very much an allegorical history of that time period with fictionalized vampires thrown into the mix. Fundamentally, that depends on one's definitions of strength and weakness. I mean, what kind of female is stronger? The girl who fights off her attacker and is never abused because she kicks so much ass? Or the girl who survives abuse and endures the aftermath? Would a girl be weak if she completely gives her heart and soul to love and all the vulnerability that such a resignation entails? Or would real weakness be to shut yourself off from people and never feel love for anyone? I see Haley as all of the above. And despite her great power, she frequently uses it in ways that are violent and cruel and psychotic, and I think that's inarguably a weakness. She's also completely consumed by an obsessive, almost symbiotic love for Elric. Now to me, giving that much of yourself to another and being subservient to that passion is a sign of great strength and fortitude. Now others would disagree and say it's a weakness to weave your own identity so deeply into another. So consequently, her strength or weakness is relative to your own point of view. As far as I'm concerned, her strengths and weaknesses manifest in different facets of her personality. Thus, I see aspects of Haley as both a weak little girl and a strong and confident goddess all wrapped up in one. I feel that dynamic and those contradictions make her endearing. You know, she's not always a strong girl to admire, but she's not always a weak girl to pity. You know, she's both. She's basically the amalgam of every goth girl I ever dated, if they had been megalomaniacal vampires. Oh, definitely. I would often create promotional flyers written in second person in an appeal to connect with the fan base I knew would appreciate these books. You know, this is for the kids who are the outcasts and the freaks. This is for the goth kid with no friends. But this story is also for the popular cheerleader who has never told anyone about the horrible thing that happened to her at the frat party. It's not about 
who you are on the outside. It's about what has happened to you inside. I constantly emphasize to people that the Vampire Noctuaries does not have any of the typical cliches of vampire stories. These characters were invented in 1991. That's before Buffy the Vampire Slayer, before Twilight, before True Blood, and all these other trendy vampire books and movies. The Vampire Noctuaries follows none of those trends because it existed before any of those trends were written. There are no vampire hunters, or love triangles, or werewolves, or quests to cure vampirism, or wars between vampire clans, or a chosen one set to change the world. This is a story about the real pains and heartaches of life, set against a backdrop of betrayal and bereavement and vampires who revel in their power instead of lamenting it. And those are some damn fun characters to take to a Nine Inch Nails concert. Well, I certainly hope not. I mean, years ago, I read a fantasy novel by a woman who wrote very confusing and complicated battle sequences. And when I finished the book, I read her autobiography and it said she was a career Marine. Well, that explained a lot. She knew a little too much about military strategy, and therefore she couldn't describe it in layman terms. Trudging through her terminology and descriptions was arduous. The rest of the book was fine. You know, the rest of the book was accessible. The great irony was the facet of the story that utilized her most abundant expertise was the most poorly written part of the tale. So ever since that experience, I've always wanted to remain cognizant of such mistakes in my own writing. I never want to get so immersed in showing off my knowledge of a topic that it alienates readers who are unfamiliar with it. So, no. I don't think readers need to be intimately familiar with the goth scene in order to appreciate this series, because when you get right down to it, although there are tons of references to the goth scene in the novels, this is a story about love and loss and heartbreak. I think everyone can relate to those emotions, even if they don't own any Click Click albums. Can the Vampire Noctuaries be a paranormal romance when there are no overbearing fathers forbidding lovers to meet, and no girls torn between picking two guys and no lovemaking in horse stables? You know, the back cover of the original Gothic Rainbow categorized it as dark fantasy slash literature because I felt my work had every right to be granted the same respect typically reserved for the category of literature. And just the other day, I saw an interview with Harlan Ellison, who is one of my writing idols, and he spoke about walking out of a television interview in 1980 because they introduced him as a science fiction author. He argued that he wanted to be respected as a writer and not labeled and compartmentalized. I hate granular genre labels too. I view the Vampire Noctuaries as fiction, and that's all. Since people insist upon being a bit more explicit, I can concede to call it a fantasy book. In fact, I remain willing to continue calling it dark fantasy because it does get pretty deep into the anguishing sides of life, but I still view it as literary too. And once you start calling a book dark fantasy, urban fantasy, paranormal romance, young adult, new adult, self-help vegan cookbook, I mean, why bother to read it anymore? I think when books become overly categorized, it can work against them because 
people start making too many assumptions about what the story entails. Well, as I said, I hate getting too granular with labels and categories. Uh, one of the reasons I find labels annoying is because they never serve their purpose. I mean, labels are created to define and categorize stories, but if you ask every author, every publisher, every reader what their definitions are, you'll get a different answer. I mean, some of the fools, you can see them online in forums and Twitter chats, they debate with each other over definitions of a category. I mean, no one knows. So you go to all this trouble to compartmentalize a book, and in the end, people still have no clue what the hell to expect when they read it. So I can give you my opinion of what those categories mean, but that doesn't mean anyone else will agree, nor will it mean any of us are correct. It's all arbitrary, it's all ambiguous. However, in answer to your question, I view horror as being fairly bloody and gory. That's just not my style. I'm, I'm not into that. And that's not to say there's no violence in my story. There's a ton of violence. I just don't hold the camera on the carnage, so to speak. You know, I don't linger on it. I cut away quickly. I'm fond of saying, I don't write about darkness, I write about shadows. That's dark fantasy to me. Horror is when the thing in the woods graphically rips your throat out. And dark fantasy is when the thing in the woods is just staring at you and you feel those eyes on the back of your neck. See, I'm the type of person who hates horror films, but I love episodes of The Twilight Zone. You know, eerie and spooky turns me on. Gory and bloody just doesn't interest me. The Gothic Rainbow was supposed to be a single book. I outlined my entire story in 1993 and started writing it in a linear fashion, beginning to end. And when I hit about 300 pages, I looked at my outline and I was like, oh, crap, this thing is going to be 900 pages long. You know, I didn't want my first novel to be a 900-page behemoth and take five years of my life to complete. Therefore, I picked a point about three-quarters of the way through where I could divide it into a 600-page book and a 300-page sequel. So that's how The Gothic Rainbow turned into the Vampire Noctuaries. The Gothic Rainbow beginning volume of the Vampire Noctuaries came out in 1997, and Anun's Maelstrom Festival concluding volume of the Vampire Noctuaries came out in 2013. Now, since the story was never intended to be divided into multiple books, the story and the structure it just didn't really support a trilogy or a tetralogy. You know, it became a duology simply because two books was the easiest way to divide the tale without doing a major restructuring to the entire outline. The writers I have always admired are the ones who write many different styles and genres of fiction. My ambition has always been to do the same. Ray Bradbury is a great example. He's often regarded as a science fiction author, but he always saw himself as a writer of fantasy. If you read his body of work, the man published 27 novels and over 600 short stories, so you, you won't read them all, you will see he wrote more than science fiction. So yes, I have a novel I'm working on that I'm hoping to have finished by December 2013. I'm keeping the details secret for now, but it has nothing to do with vampires or spooky things hiding under the bed. I've always maintained that the telling facet of storytelling is the most important part. So hopefully, any fans who appreciate my storytelling in the Vampire Noctuaries will also enjoy the way my next story is told. 
Well, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe and like the video, and uh, we'll catch you next time.